Well, welcome everyone. We uh, very much appreciate you coming to visit Ross Camp Institute and to share uh, and learn with us some of the science that we have uh, for our veterans research programs that we have. So uh, this is our second year that we're hosting the Veterans Open House. And uh, to start off in our introduction, I want to introduce uh, Fiona Crawford, who's our CEO and president of Ross Camp Institute. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm just delighted to see you all here today. Uh, we are honoured to be able to host this event. We are challenged and dedicated to the work we're doing. I'm just going to say a few words uh, just to give you a sort of a big picture. I know some of you know us well. Some of you, I think, are new to the Institute. So I'm just going to give a little bit of a background of what we do here and uh, and then let you loose with all the clinical staff and our research staff and there'll be plenty of time for for interaction with everybody um, it's my distinct honor to be the president and ceo of this unique organization so the ross camp institute is a not-for-profit uh, standalone institute we've been here since 2003 and we've got about 60 scientists and clinicians working primarily on conditions that are neurological and neuropsychiatric in nature. And we have folks who have been working with us here for 20 years or, or more together as part of this team. And actually, I think that's one of the very strong uh, aspects of the Ross Kemp Institute. We have folks who have been together for a long time. We've worked together. We know each other's foibles. We know each other's strengths. It's, a, it's an extremely integrative work environment here, and I think you'll probably see that if you, if you go on uh, one of our tours. There's a lot of interaction. It's one of those things that people refer to as an open doors environment. Of course, there's closed doors because there's labs and we need to contain things, uh, especially the mice. But um, we, we have a very open doors policy. You know, the scientists get together, they interact, they go from one lab to another. They're talking to each other all the time. And that's the way for research to move forward. Our scientists then interact with our clinicians so that even if they spend their entire day working with mice or working with test tubes or working with cells, they understand and they know what it is that they're trying to tackle. They have a picture of that in their mind. And the other thing that we do, which is probably quite unique, is we're very flexible and we can change direction quickly. And what I mean by that is if we get new data today that says that yesterday's hypothesis was wrong, we will change direction. We will not keep going single-mindedly in one direction because we once upon a time had an idea that that was the way to go. We move fast and we move effectively. And that's why we've been, we've been successful. And I want to just tell you very briefly about some of our success so that you can understand why I'm very optimistic that we can use those same skills, those same attributes, that experience as we move forward tackling all the other conditions that we want to, to address. Just briefly, uh, since folks usually want to know how are we funded, we're funded by all the traditional uh, funding agencies, the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, the VA. We're also funded, of course, by the Roskamp Foundation, and, and Bob Roskamp is here today, and really, this would not be here. We would not be here doing this if it weren't for he and Diane Roskamp. They have supported us for many, many years now. Their funding uh, through their foundation provides us with that, um, what's the term, sort of unrestricted funding. If we find something out today that looks really interesting, but it's not something that was part of a DOD program or a VA program, we can pursue it a little distance and see, is that something that, that really is worth going after? And so their, their funding, their support are absolutely instrumental to, to the success of this whole operation. We also have um, public-private partnerships we also, because of the expertise we have here, we provide contract research services for other folks, for collaborators who maybe don't have access to the knowledge, to the expertise, to the equipment that we have here. So just very briefly, how the Ross Kemp Institute came about is because many, many, many years ago now, uh, Dr. Mullen and I were part of the team that identified the first genetic causes of Alzheimer's disease, and that was back in London in the early 1990s. And the identification of those genetic errors enabled the creation of laboratory models of the disease. Up until that point, human beings, Alzheimer patients, 
were the guinea pigs for any drugs to test for Alzheimer's disease. But by identifying these causes of the disease, we were able to model in the laboratory. We were able to create mice that could recapitulate some of the features of Alzheimer's disease. So that meant then that any research group around the world, any research team, any pharmaceutical company could test any drugs, could develop drugs, and test them in those animal models and see whether they were able to prevent the disease from happening in the mice, and therefore that would take them one step forward to having something that might work in humans. We publish widely on all of our research in peer-reviewed journals. I think we've well over 200 scientific publications now. Um, we've moved from having our Alzheimer program, which is still ongoing, I'll mention again in a moment, we now have many other research programs, some of particular relevance to, to veterans, which is really what we're going to be focusing on today. But with regard to our Alzheimer program, that's the one that's been worked on the longest by our scientists, so that's the one that's furthest down the path. And I'm delighted to tell you, or to remind some of you, that we have a drug, a novel drug for Alzheimer's disease, that is currently in phase three cl clinical trials in Europe which is the final stage before something getting approved. Now, I just came back from the clinical, excuse me, the clinical trials in Alzheimer's meeting, and as many of you will be aware, there really has been no good news in Alzheimer's clinical trials for a very long time. And one of the reasons is that the drugs that have been used have tended to target one aspect of Alzheimer's disease, maybe the buildup of amyloid in the brain, or maybe the tau phosphorylation, or maybe the neuroinflammation. And what we now know is that because of the nature of Alzheimer's disease, it's a slow, progressive deterioration. So by the time somebody comes into the clinic presenting with Alzheimer's disease, all of these things are going on. And trying to tackle just one of them is likely not going to be effective, especially if folks are not in the very early stages of the disease. So the drug that we have in clinical trial in Europe is actually a drug that tackles three of the main pathologies of Alzheimer's disease. And I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of that here. I think there's some information in, in, your, uh, in your folders, and we have papers out on the table if you want to know the details. But I'm optimistic about, about that drug because it tackles three different things. And that trial, fully recruited in April of this year, 500 individuals uh, with Alzheimer's disease, and it's, a, it's just the same as any study we would do here in the United States. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. The final recruit went in in April of this year, so they will complete round about October of next year, 2016. So we should have the results of that study in late 2016, early 2017. And I'm really excited about that. And maybe it'll be the case that everybody treated did not improve. Maybe it'll only be the people who were treated because they were, they were in the earlier stage of the disease, or maybe it'll be people with a particular genotype. But I'm very optimistic about that study. And I'm, I'm, I also, I always say this, but I think it's remarkable if you look at the clinical trials that are currently ongoing for Alzheimer's disease. It's people you know, you know, it's Pfizer, it's Eli Lilly, it's Johnson and Johnson. It's the Roskamp Institute. I think that's fantastic. I think it's fantastic that here in Sarasota, we've got a drug in phase three clinical trials in Europe that was done because of research here. That's happening because of the work that we've been doing here for the last 20 years. The other thing I want to mention just briefly, one of our other products is scientists. We have a PhD program here, a very unique one. Uh, we run it in conjunction with the Open University in the UK. And I think four of the tour operators today are PhD students in our program. We graduated three students from our program this year. And three more have literally arrived in the last two weeks. So we're keeping that going. And those folks spend three years working at the bench side by side with our scientists and graduate with PhDs and go on to great things. One of our recent graduates is now at Mount Sinai in New York. Another is at Jefferson. And another one, I think, is just about to pick up a very nice job with Thermo Scientific. So they go on to good things. So we're creating new scientists right here in Sarasota. Very briefly, I'm not going to go into this picture in much detail. I've shown it before. It's kind of an overview of our approach. What we do, I mentioned it already, if we have a good model for the conditions that we're interested in, Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injury, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, Gulf War illness. If we have a good model or models for those conditions, then we can start to characterize them. And you're going to see a lot of this if you go on the tour today. You're going to learn about neurobehavioral testing from Dr. Ferguson. You're going to learn about molecular profiling from Dr. Abdullah. You're going to learn about neuropathological analyses from Dr. Mouzon. You're going to see all the ways that we can characterize our animal models. And what we can do is then we can match up how the animals behave how their, how their cognitive uh, function is declining, how their motor function maybe is declining. We can match that up with what's happening in the brain. And that leads us to the identification of targets for us to tackle with therapeutic intervention. And of course, at the end of the day, everything has to be relevant for our patient population. So again, we come back to our interactions, our relationship here, our own clinic and lab interface, and then our relationship with the Tampa VA and other hospitals in the area and around the country, but most importantly, with the patient population. And one of the things we're pushing very hard to do is to have clinical trials here in our own clinic that have come about because of the research that we're doing here in our labs. And we're quite far down the path with that. I can't say too much at this point, but I, I think we're going to have uh, some of those trials hopefully coming on board in the, in the coming years. Trials that are focusing on, on those conditions but have come about from our research here in the labs. So the programs ongoing at the Institute, this isn't all of them, um, but we can see we've got a selection here and we're really going to focus today uh, on the research side. We're going to focus really on traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder and Gulf War illness. We're going to start off the program with the clinical presentation by, by Gillian. So she's going to tell you what's happening at the moment in our clinic and what sort of things are going on there. And then the next presentations are kind of going to be looking into the future. They're going to be what we think is coming because it's going to be what we're doing in the labs right now and how we think that's going to result in new applications in the clinic in the coming years. I've also mentioned at the bottom there, Archer Pharmaceuticals is our spin-out company that is moving forward in Europe with that drug for Alzheimer's disease. And SRQ Bio, which you can see some of the signs around here, that's our contract research organization. So that's really all I had to say, just an introduction, overview for the Institute. I'm delighted to have you all here today. I hope that you will participate in the tours, ask lots of questions, hang around for lunch and interact with the scientists. And I hope that, uh, that you'll learn a lot about the Institute here today. Thank you very much. So I'd now like to introduce Gillian, who is going to be telling you all about what's going on in our clinic. Thanks, Gillian. Hi, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, my name is Gillian Chaikin, and I'm a clinical research coordinator here at the Ross Camp Institute. Um, so as Fiona said, we are kind of unique here at Ross Camp, um, as we are considered a bench to bedside approach. Um, we have our, of course, our research and development portion with the Institute, which will be discussed in the upcoming uh, presentations. And then, of course, I'm with the Clinical Trials Division, and then we have a private practice um, led by Dr. Andrew Keegan. Um, so in our Clinical Trials Division, we are um, devoted to pharmaceutical research. And our current studies are for the following indications. Um, Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and we will have an upcoming migraine study. So clinical trials are being conducted um, to collect data regarding safety and efficacy of a new drug or device. There are several steps uh, that need to be done in order for get in order to get a drug approved and to market, if at ever it gets there. Um, human testing uh, of, ex of these experimental drugs and devices are conducted in four phases, which I'm going to go over very briefly. Um, each phase is considered a separate trial. And after the completion of each phase, investigators are required to submit the data um, to the FDA before we can go on to the next phase. 
So phase one in research um, is just to assess safety of the drug or device. Um, this is typically done in a population of healthy volunteers, typically college students, um, to determine the um, the effects of the drug or device on humans. So this is more or less how it is metabolized, uh, absorbed, and excreted. It can take several months to complete. Phase two is all about testing the efficacy of the drug or device. Um, this can involve up to several hundred patients and can take several months uh, to two years to complete. Uh, these studies are randomized, meaning that one group will receive the experimental drug. Um, while the other or is a control group um, and will receive the standard treatment or placebo. These studies are often blinded, uh, meaning that neither the patients nor the researchers involved uh, know if, uh, who, is, who is actually receiving the experimental drug. And this is done so that we can provide the pharmaceutical company um, and the FDA with this comparative information. Phase three studies, they are being done uh, randomized and blinded testing on several hundred to several thousand patients. Um, this can last for several years and it is a very thorough understanding of the effectiveness of a drug. Um, it also will kind of go in more about the range of possible side effects of that drug um, and what people can expect. Once phase three is complete, only once it is complete, can we actually um, put in a request to the FDA for approval uh, for marketing of this drug. And then phase four studies are, of course, post-marketing, more surveillance trials um, conducted after the device has already been approved for consumption. And it is really just looking at long-term effectiveness, maybe some cost effectiveness of the drug. And here at Ross Camp in our clinical trials division, we're doing mostly phase two and three studies. So you may ask why participate in a clinical trial? Um, of course, medical researchers aim to better medication treatment, diagnostic procedures um, for the betterment of medicine and improvement for human lives. Uh, no amount of clinical trials, of, of non-clinical trials and animal testing um, can substitute for the importance of actual human studies. And once somebody is involved in a clinical trial, they, they are able to gain a lot of benefit. Um, it's, you know, a new treatment, a new procedure that's not yet available to the public. They receive very quality, very intensive care from um, our group of neurologists and study coordinators. And we communicate very um, efficiently and effectively with their current physician. Um, and of course, with clinical studies, no insurance is needed. So it's being done um, through the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company. Um, patients don't need um, any kind of insurance, and um, they're receiving that free medical care. And of course, others just want to be involved in research because they want to contribute to the science behind um, what we have up and coming. So our current enrolling studies, um, we have a Parkinson's study. Uh, it's call, called our BioRossi trial. And I'll go through all of these studies a little bit in detail. Um, we have our ASSESS study for multiple sclerosis and some cognition studies for multiple sclerosis as well. And with our Alzheimer's disease, we have uh, three studies right now, ACERA, Amaranth, and Precision Med. So, uh, Biorossi is a Parkinson's study, two protocols for this trial, a 16-week and a 26-week. Um, it's involving the efficacy of an extended release amantadine in individuals who experience levodopa-induced dyskinesia. And this is for individuals 30 to 85 years old. Um, it has three arms of the study, a lower dose, a higher dose, and placebo dose. 
Um, ACERA is a study for Alzheimer's disease. Exana is a product that is currently on the market. Um, it was re, uh, reformulated due to some gastrointestinal side effects, and so we're doing the study with this reformulated version. Uh, this is a daily shake that individuals take. It's a combination of different coconut oils, vitamins, and minerals. And this is for individuals 66 to 90 who have dementia. And it's a six-month double-blind study, but then it's followed up by a six-month open-label study, meaning that individuals will receive the actual study product in the last six months, guaranteed. Um, this AstraZeneca Amaranth study is actually for both individuals who have mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Um, it aims to decrease the tau protein um, known to contribute to the disease. And it's a two-year study, double-blind, um, with possible and open label coming. Um, and this is for f individuals 55 to 85 years old who either have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease already and mild cognitive impairment, or we can use our screening visit with this study to uh, diagnose an individual if they have not yet been diagnosed. And our precision med trial is more of a registry. It's no, not a treatment study uh, involving a medication, but it is um, a cognition study for individuals 50 and older who have been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Um, ASSESS is one of our MS studies, and that is a one-year study comparing Gelenia and Capaxone. Both of those drugs are already approved and on the market for MS treatment. There's no placebo involved, and this is for individuals with relapsing remitting MS. And 7-Eleven is our in-house, one of our in-house studies. It's for healthy individuals who are 55 and older. Um, it's a seven to 10 year longitudinal study. Um, we're looking at healthy people who have no, con no cognitive di diagnosis at the time of enrollment. We follow them over the next seven to t 10 years uh, with memory tests. And at the first visit, we draw a sample of blood. So as the patient progresses in the, in the trial, if they were to develop any kind of cognitive impairment, our scientists here are analyzing the blood samples, trying to identify biomarkers which may predispose individuals to dementia. And as I said, coming soon, we have our migraine study and um, an Alzheimer's with agitation trial. If you are interested in participating in the study, the best thing to do is to give us a call um, and to speak with a research coordinator for, the, for an over-the-phone assessment. Um, we then will schedule the person to come in for a screening visit to see if they further qualify. And I have brochures, sign-up sheets um, out in the hall if anyone is interested in further information. And next, we have Dr. Ojo and he's gonna be speaking about post-traumatic stress disorder. Thank you. Good morning, my name's um, Dr. Joseph Ojo. Um, I'm a postdoctoral scientist here at the Ruskamp Institute, and I work on post-traumatic stress disorder. So over the next 10 minutes, I'll be talking to you about <clears throat> giving you a brief background on what PTSD is. I'm going to share with you the relevance it has to the veteran health. And I'm also going to talk to you about the current research we're doing here in animal models as well as in humans. I'm going to talk to you also about the research benefits of some of the work we're doing here with respect to the military population and what you can do to further our research. So PTSD um, is diagnosed based on what the clinicians refer to as the DSMV criteria. It um, happens as a result of exposure to a traumatic event, such as witnessing the death of a loved one, uh, being part of a serious life-threatening injury, and being a victim of sexual violence. And there are four distinct symptoms that patients typically show. Uh, the first one is the recollection of multiple intrusive or traumatic memories. 
as well as avoidance behavior towards those traumatic memories. Patients also show ne negative alterations in cognition and mood, as well as alterations in arousal states. Patients typically have a hypervigilance type of um, state. And this symptom, clusters of symptoms have to be present for over a month for it to have a clinical impact. And this picture right here pretty much summarizes all I've talked to you about. You can see the different emotions that a patient will show, such as fearfulness, trouble sleeping, flashbacks, nightmares, guiltiness, um, a feeling of being abandoned, nervousness, rejection, and self-blame. Scientists today refer to PTSD as the signature unseen wound of combat. And the statistic shows that from the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, that 300,000 of those involved in that conflict suffer from PTSD today. And the numbers are even much more higher for the Vietnam era, whereby 30% of those who returned back alive from the war show signs of PTSD. Military suicides have been shown to be at the highest level um, for the last 10 years. And the national statistics shows that 20% of the national suicides are completed by veterans. Interestingly, in 2012, it was shown that most of the military, um, most of the deaths that happened in the military were a result of suicides rather than fighting in the line of duty. So this pretty much summarizes how serious an issue this is for the military um, health, veteran health. I put together this slide to show you some of the points with respect to the current state of research in this field. So first of all, PTSD can be quite um, complex with respect to its diagnosis. Sometimes it happens in com combination with a traumatic brain injury. And patients who show um, signs of what we refer to as post-concussive syndrome after a traumatic brain injury share an overlap with some of the clusters of symptoms that you see in PTSD as well as heterogeneous symptoms. So it can be quite difficult for clinicians to tease out both aspects of the, of the condition. With respect to the treatments, there are only few therapeutic approaches to treat PTSD today. And even the ones that are being used are, are, very, are most, most, mostly ineffective with respect to alleviating some of the PTSD symptoms. Um, with respect to combat-related uh, PTSD, Patients are typically very refractory to the treatments, and even those that show initial signs of um, benefit early on go on to have relapse later on. And obviously, it's a huge burden on healthcare costs. So together, all of this pretty much underscores the reason why we scientists need to identify new perspectives on how to treat um, PTSD and understand some of the biological responses involved in PTSD. So I put together this slide here uh, just to give you a brief background of the neurobiological basis of PTSD. If you look on the left side here with the guy wielding the knife, this is the traumatic event. And you can substitute that for a fellow who just saw one of his friends being blown up by an IED, for example. There are certain regions in the brain located here on the right that, for example, in the frontal lobe and embedded deep in the temporal lobe that store these traumatic memories. And they signal to other parts of the brain, such as the pituitary gland, located at the base of the brain. And they release hormones into the bloodstream, which can then signal to other peripheral organs, like your adrenal glands, located right above your kidneys. And they also release furthermore hormones that regulate aspects of physiological uh, mechanism, homeostatic mechanisms, such as blood pressure, heart rate, and blood flow to vital organs. In a normal individual, this changes, subsides, and returns back to normal. But in a person who suffers from PTSD, there's a dysfunction in the regulatory mechanisms involved. And this is what we're trying to understand, what the molecular basis of this dysfunction is. So with respect to the clinical studies we're doing here, um, 
we stud we've we've um, done some studies on active duty soldiers. We've looked at a cohort of soldiers uh, pre-deployment as well as post-deployment before they went to war and when they came back. And we collected blood samples from these um, soldiers and looked for changes in proteins, lipids, as well as the genotypes and the genetic background to try to understand what might be going on with respect to why some, some individuals return from war, having been exposed to the same traumatic events, uh, end up having PTSD and why some are resilient. And also with our collaborators, we can also correlate some of the peripheral changes that we see in the blood with changes going on in the brain with neuroimaging techniques. Um, another research that we do here, which I'm personally involved in, is looking at animal models. Um, animal models have quite advantages because they allow us to do a lot of things that we can't do in, han in human beings. Um, they have a relatively short lifespan, so we can monitor them from birth to death. We can genetically manipulate them, and they're quite easy to handle and work with. So here at the Roskamp Institute, we've developed a model of PTSD, where we expose animals to mice to different aversive stimuli, such as physical trauma in the form of inescapable foot shocks. We also um, expose them to predator exposure. Uh, which elicits an innate fear response in those animals. Um, there's also um, social stresses that we can simulate, as well as a traumatic brain injury, which uh, Dr. Muzan's gonna be talking about later on. Um, from this animal studies, we're able to test some of the behavioral outcome measures in these mice. Dr. Ferguson is going to be talking to you about some of this later on during the um, visitation to the different parts of the institute. So, for example, here we have a test that we refer to as the elevated plus base, and it consists of two closed arms and two open arms. A mouse that is very anxious would tend to stay in the enclosure here in the closed arm, as you can see while a mouse that has increased, increased exploratory behavior would tend to stay in the open arms. And we can use this as an index of anxiety. There are other different tests we can do to measure certain behavioral measures, but I'm not gonna go too much into it. This is the radial arm water maze that we can use to test aspects of cognition and mood. Um, also, we are able to monitor sleep-wake cycle over a 24 hour period as well, as well as social interaction between one animal and another. So from these animal studies, we're able to interrogate different tissues that we collect from the animals, um, blood samples as well, different brain regions that we dissect out that are relevant to PTSD, as well as peripheral organs, such as the adrenal gland that we can look further into to try to understand using our repertoire of different techniques like pathology, proteomics to detect changes in proteins, lipidomics to detect changes in lipids, and epigenetics to detect changes in DNA modification. And we're able to try to have a better understanding of the biological responses that happens in PTSD. So we're hoping uh, our research will benefit the military population by helping us identify early biomarkers that correlate with PTSD, why some patients show resiliency and why some are more susceptible and show predisposition to PTSD. We're hoping our work can facilitate early detection and intervention before some of the negative um, consequences emerge, as well as identify new therapeutic targets for drug discovery, which we can translate to humans. So what can you do to help us with our research? You can visit our clinic and participate in clinical trials, um, studies we're doing. You can give details of your past history, which we are very interested in. And if required, donate blood samples for clinical research. And I'd like to thank you for coming today to our open house. And I'll hand over to Dr. Leila Abdullah, who's gonna talk to you about Gulf War illness. Thank you very much. Well, thank
thank you for giving me oppor an opportunity to come and talk about my work in Gulf War illness. Um, just a little bit of background, I did my PhD work here at the Ross Camp Institute on Gulf War illness. My thesis was to develop mouse models of Gulf War illness. And um, subsequent to that, um, I decided to stay here and continue this work as, um, as I delved deeper into the science behind what was happening um, in the brain and in, in, in what was happening to the veterans with Gulf War illness. Um, I thought I could make a difference here, so I decided to stay here and continue my work with Gulf War illness. And I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've done here. So one of the key focus here, as um, Ojo alluded to, some of, a lot of what we do here is um, we try to tackle this at a, at a level of a mice where, as you can, as he mentioned, that we can cover a lifespan of a mouse and see what's happening um, using various tissue, which is very difficult to do in humans. So one of the things that I, as I mentioned, I did is I developed a mouse model of Gulf War illness using some of the chemicals that we now know are potentially implicated in our, in our causative of Gulf War illness. So here, um, what we do here is very early on, when mice are much younger, we give them um, pesticides and paradistochin marine bromide, which are chemicals that have been implicated in Gulf War illness. And then we wait, and we wait months later and see what's happening. We examine them. Um, we look at their memory, we look at their other behavior, and then um, we look at their brain and blood, and we try to figure out what's happening to them. We were, tr we we're trying to find a clue. Um, then we can develop therapies, and we can develop um, biomarkers that can help diagnose the disease. So one such study, so here in this study, we were giving, we had given um, PB and permethrin, as I'm going to refer to, uh, or Gulf War chemicals. And um, what, we, what we did is um, we waited 16 months bef after the exposure. It's a really long time, covers many decades of lifetime in a mouse. And what we saw, um, what we first did is we uh, taught them how to escape. Mice don't like being in bright light. They they want to go in into a small hole and escape. So we taught them how to escape the bright lights. This is called the Barnes maze test. And um, here, as you can see on your right, that over the training period, mice that didn't receive chemicals, Gulf War chemicals, they were doing much better compared to the mice that did receive. Um, they took much longer to find their escape route and escape into the box. And we test them, tested them several times after that, and they continued to display the impairment of what we call the memory impairment here. Um, next, we um, did the autopsy of their brain tissue. And what we found here, you can see that these, um, these cells, they're, in, they're called estroglia. They're involved in supporting the brain, supplying nutrients to the brain. And the other cells that are called S, uh, microglia, that they do immune surveillance of the brain. As you can see, they're in their heightened state um, in, in mice that receive the Gulf War chemicals. They are, even 16 months later, it's such a long time that these mice continue to display um, brain pathology. And we think that by targeting these brain factors and these glia cells, we might be able to come up with some therapies that we can actually target these cells and improve the health um, in this mice and hopefully translate that into um, patients. So as part of my PhD work, I got interested in lipids. Um, we found um, this area to be particularly important to the brain because so when you think of the brain, you might as well think of it as a big lump of cheese to the right. Um, the reason being is that there's so much lipid, or otherwise known as fat, there's so much of that in the brain. It's used to cushion the cell uh, of the brain, nerve cells. Um, it's used to um, insulate the nerve cells. It's used to 
supply nutrients to the brain. So it represents a very important aspect uh, for the brain, and it's very important molecules. These, there are various different lipids or fats that are very important for the brain. So just in terms of what types of lipids or fats are out there, you're probably familiar with the saturated fats. Um, they is, those are the butters that you eat. Um, they're high in vegetable oil. Um, and then the, there are the other kind of fat that are called the unsaturated, which are uh, the good ones that come from the fish, the sardines that are oily. They're called the omega-3 and DHA. And then there's the, we call them the bad kind because they come from the animal fat and it's found in your hamburger. <laughs> and it's called the omega-6, which is, and it's involved in it propagating um, inflammatory response. So, you know, we, there's a balance of that in our, in our body and we need to maintain that homeostasis. And we think that, so we're investigating to see if these fats could potentially serve as a signature in the blood um, that we can see, and then maybe in the brain, if we can restore their balance in the brain, their normal ratio, then maybe it could be a potential avenue for treatment. So in collaboration with the Gulf War Research Illness Research Consortium that's um, run by Dr. Nancy Clemens and Dr. Sel Kimberly Sullivan um, and funded by the Department of Defense, uh, we were able to, we were lucky enough to get some blood samples donated kindly from the veterans, Gulf War veterans, and we looked at the, these lipids in the blood samples. And here we see that in veterans who were diagnosed with GWI, these lipids are much higher than the, than the ones that didn't get a diagnosis of GWI. Um, so we, you know, there's a lot of work to do. This is very early. We need to look at a much larger sample size, uh, much you know, larger number of veterans, Gulf War veterans, to see if it's similar across different groups of Gulf War veterans. Um, but we think it's potentially useful, and then understanding what's happening here will give us clue and be able to help with diagnosis as well as um, um, potentially be used for targeting. And so I've actually gone on, um, I was recently funded um, from the Department of Defense, um, and um, I've started my work in this area, potentially looking at lipids as a potential treatment. So here, as I mentioned earlier, in our mouse models, what we do is um, we, um, as I said, the exposure, then we wait. So this is five months after the Gulf War exposure. So we're looking at here mice that didn't receive any Gulf War agents. Here mice that did receive Gulf War agents. As you can see, the cells, the glia cells that I was talking about are much higher here. And these are the cells that are involved in nutritional support of the brain called the estroglia cells again. So, but here, um, there is a therapy that I'm testing in these mice. Uh, it is a type of a lipid. It's a natural lipid it's found in our body. Um, so here, I, you know, we, I took the synthetic form of that lipid and I gave it to the mice to see what happens um, to the brain. And as you can see here, um, and you can, it's quantified here, but as you can see this image here, that mice that had the Gulf War agent given to them before and after the treatment, um, they have much less of the, the glia cell being um, proliferated here. Um, so, you know, again, I'll emphasize that this is very early work. We have a lot more to do, but it is an avenue we're testing, and then it's giving us some result that tells us to follow up in this area. And then, um, so as I mentioned, the, the good and the bad lipids. So the good lipid DHA um, can be, uh, there's a biosynthetic pathway where, which actually there's a shorter form of the good lipid that can be elongated to DHA. So we're looking to see what's happening in the brain, um, how that conversion occurs. So that conversion seems to be reduced in the PVPAR exposed mice, but after the treatment, we seem to be able to restoring that. Um, so 
hopefully it'll we'll do some more studies to make sure that this is actually happening and how long after the treatment and after different types of treatment, duration of treatment, whether this is a persistent response. But it is encouraging and it tells us to follow up in this area. And this is the bad lipid called the arachidonic acid. The treatment doesn't seem to be doing the same thing. So it's specifically targeting um, the DHA. So we're very happy to see that. Um, so this is, I've just presented some of our work. There's a lot more going on through our, you know, Dr. Ganya Gazala, Dr. Crawford. We're all working together in different aspects of the work to try to find treatments for GWI. Um, so I just want to thank my team, members here, um, and the GWI consortium, Dr. Clemens and Dr. Sullivan, who um, provided us with the blood samples. And I want to thank the Department of Defense and the VA for funding us and funding this work. And the, of course, the Ross Camp Foundation, that gives us the flexibility to do this work. And I thank you for your time. I'll hand it over. <laughs> so I'll hand that over to Ben Ramwazo, who's going to talk about the traumatic brain injury. OK, that's good. All right, good morning, everybody. So my name is uh, Dr. Mouzon. And I just want to, before we start, this is really a day for you and us to interact each other. So if you have any question, please raise your hand or don't hesitate to interrupt me because I'm here to, we are here to cross talk and help each other to find solution for the problem, which is traumatic brain injury. So I want to start, uh, this presentation will be most likely educative. Okay, we don't have any cure for traumatic brain injury. There is no treatment. So I'm gonna tell you what's going on in your brain when you get a concussion, a mild traumatic brain injury. So mild traumatic brain injury or MTBI is the same thing as a concussion. It's different terminology. Um, to start with, the, as you know, the funding for traumatic brain injury at the Institute is from the VA, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and also from the DOD, and we receive also funding from the foundation of the Roskamp Institute. So this is a very difficult problem to tackle, traumatic brain injury. So there is, we work a lot with, we have a large collaboration group. So we are part of the CNC. It's the Chronic Effect of Neurotra Neurotrauma Consortium. Mm -hmm. So what we study here is what are the consequences, the long-term consequences of a concussion over your lifetime. And we are not the only one to study this. Is, those are all the, the VA, the different VA across the nation who are working on this problem. Not only on a national level, but we're also collaborating with the European Union, because this is not only, again, you have the European who goes to war sometime, even if the French don't go very often, <laughs> but we do have the English, the French, and uh, the US, obviously. So we all work together as a unity. So what is traumatic brain injury? Usually, the, by definition, it's an external force arising from blunt or penetrating or acceleration deceleration who significantly disrupt your brain function. So you have mild traumatic brain injury, moderate, severe. You can have blast traumatic brain injury. You can have penetrating traumatic brain injury with a bullet. You could also have compression traumatic brain injury, let's say, you, there is an explosion, you are stuck in a building, and you have a slab, concrete slab, compress your brain, like an earthquake or a blast injury in a building. So what I want to show you here, so this is a child who received a, a penetrating brain injury by an Eiffel Tower. And yes, Eiffel Tower can be uh, dangerous, if, especially for kids. The key with this picture is, what I want to focus is, you have type, some type of brain injury are very, you can see the trauma. It's very emotional. You can see bleeding, you have huge swelling. Now, if you think about a concussion, football player or the military, you get a car accident in your Humvee, you get blasted. If you don't see any external sign, it's not because you don't see bleeding or something in your head that you are not, your brain is not injured, okay? So that's the, the, the critical point is, it's, if you get a concussion, you need to take some rest. You don't want to go back on the field. You don't want to go back play if you are playing football. You want to step out 
and rest. And I'm gonna explain you that later. I have some video and picture to show you what's going on after a concussion. Again, you cannot see it. And you, because you can't see it, you don't seek medical attention. Same thing for the Eiffel Tower. The, the child went to the hospital, he got discharged in 48 hours and no long-term consequence. Get a concussion, you don't see anything, you return to play or you go back on the field. If you get hit again, it would be much more worse. So don't wait for the autopsy. <laughs> now, what's going on in your brain? This is, we use, because the brain is very complex, so we can do study in vitro, like we can grow neurons on a Petri dish, but we can also, we have to use animal at some point to study, because it's such a complex organ, we have to use an, an animal to study my traumatic brain injury. So think about the brain as a big jello, like a jello, not a jello shot, but it's something, if you do, if you, it's, it's moving. So if you have acceleration, deceleration, you can see the structure, here is the acceleration, everything shifts inside your brain. So you have, it stretch your neurons, it stretch your axons, and at some point they can break if the, if the strength is too strong. So we, with this video, let me see, don't fall asleep. Okay, this video I'm gonna start, this will explain, uh, I have to start it of technical issue. We might, we might, we, we will skip the video, I guess. So it was a video to show what's going on in your brain, what's going on in an axon, and uh, we might be able to see it in one of the lab tours. We will show it later. But what I want to show, so it was describing what's going on in your brain. And now, so, the end result says, this is brain picture, human brain. So you have a control subject on the top. So you don't see any staining. You see there is right here. It's clear, so it means it's healthy. Now after a head injury, a concussion, you can see the brain staining. It means that you have molecules who start to accumulate in your axon, the structure of your brain, because it's been stretched. So axons are a little bit like highways who connect cities together. If you damage the road, then the cargo molecule cannot go along and they start to, to jam together. And this is what's why you can see the brain standing. Those are the protein, they cannot move, so they start accumulating. And if you, if you wait a little bit more, they will bead like that. This is a beading process. And the axon will be cut. So your brain connection at this point is damaged, cut, so no more connection going on. So now this is the same picture, this is an axon, it's a magnification of what you saw in the previous picture. And why you don't want to return to play, why you don't want to return to the field fight is, is explained right here. So this is a swelling, as you can see, and you have all of those, the little brown dark dot are proteins who accumulates. Now because it's, if you receive a concussion, it's a mild traumatic brain injury, so not everything is broken and you can see an intact microtubule, a structure, one of those rods here. And if you give it some rest, this rod who is intact will pick up everything and it will continue the transport and your neuron will survive. So that's why you don't want to return to play too quickly. That's why you don't want to return on the field that quickly. And this is where we need to change the mentality in the military and as well on, uh, on, uh, in school, in athletics and football. So by, if you get after concussion, 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 this is a picture who shows the human brain network. So this is a control subject on your left and you have an injured subject on your right. So this is after a history of concussion, you can see all the structure who are missing. So your brain is still functioning, but not as good as it used to be. So that's why you might have problem of memory, executive function, difficulty to sleep, and if you have difficulties to sleep, then you have mood disorder because you're tired, you get angry. <clears throat> it's a big, it makes a snowball effect. So what we did at the Institute, uh, we designed an animal model to study mild traumatic brain injury because in human, we don't know what's going on in the brain after a mild traumatic brain injury because you don't die of that injury. So we need to use a 
a model to look at the brain 24 hours after concussion, what's going on. So this is what we did. And this is the apparatus where we do the, to injure the, the animal. It's a very mild injury, so it's an impact on the skull. We don't even, we just shave the mouse and then we do a small impact who results, who results in a shearing or compression of the brain. So what we did, we did, we used those mice and we let them live up to 24 months post injury. And at each of the time point, 24 hours, 6, 12, 18, and 24 months, we will collect blood for biomarker. We will collect the brain to look at the pathology, lipids, we do lipid analysis, and we're also doing behavior on those animals. So we can see the progression, how the mouse recover over time. And we can see also the progression in your brain. What's going on at 24 hours, 6, 12, or 24 months post-injury. And what we found, well, this is the model. And then the goal of this model ultimately is to use treatment. So we know what's going on within a two-year period, and then we can treat the mice with the potential therapeutics. And if we see improvement in the mice, it means it can be translated to human. And this is where we are at this point here at the Institute. We, yes, a question. Doctor, can you explain how close a mouse brain might be to a human brain? Well, it's not that close. <laughs> but let's say what we do is uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So because it's so complicated that we are still learning from a mouse at this point. So we don't want to use a model who is even more complicated yet. We are going step by step. It's, it's, the mouse brain is very complicated as well, but it's, in terms of anatomical anatomy, it's very different. You, have, you don't have any GRI. You see it's a smooth brain, and the structure are very different in terms of ratio as well. But again, we need to start somewhere, and we need to start somewhere with as simple as we can. And this is the simplest. Yes. If you want to go in a higher animal model, yes, something closer will be a pig, and then it would, <coughs> sorry, then it would be primates. But before we do primates, we will do, there is so much to learn out of the mice. We don't need to waste the resources. We don't want to waste, I mean, working on pigs is, you, it's so much more expensive, and also, I mean, to maintain the pigs, it's, it's so much more work. It's not, we are not here yet. Some people do, but, and then, uh, I mean, it's not easy to work with animals, too. I mean, we are injuring the animals, so you don't want, you see the animals, so you, you try to minimize the use of animals as much as you can. So now what I'm going to show you is, like, this is in the brain, this is the, a mouse brain, and this is the corpus callosum. And we don't really see very well. But anyway, you need to look at the brain staining. This is abnormal. This is a 24 months post injury. So you can, I can see, you give me a mouse, a brain of somebody who received five injury, a mouse who received five injury, I can tell the one who received five injury, even at 24 months post injury. So there is long term consequences. It means if you were exposed to blast or any type of injury during deployment, you probably have right now consequences in your brain. And what we found, because it's ongoing, it means that the treatment can be applied at later time point too. And this is what we're trying to push. Treatment at acute time point, right after the injury, but there is also another window of treatment at later time point. And nobody has done that yet. So this is what, probably in the near future, what we're going to do in the US, maybe at the Institute, and across the world. This is what we want to push forward. Um, so this is, you were asking about, this is a mouse brain, what looks like a mouse brain. So, and this is a human brain. So you have the brain stem, the cerebellum, this is the cortex, you have the hippocampus, and the corpus callosum. Same thing, the corpus callosum is here, you have the cerebral cortex, cerebellum, brain stem. So there is huge difference, yes, but we do see similarities between mouse and human. My job was to look in the mouse, and we're also looking in human brain from an autopsy, People who give their brain, so we have brain bank in the US and in Europe. It could be food.
So there is a lot of things who are common between the mass and human. And then we also have, uh, if you have heard about CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, it's, very, it's characterized by the accumulation of tar protein in the depth of the sulci. And this is what is, uh, you have a control subject on your left, it's nice, white and blue, and this is abnormal. You have the protein from the axons who accumulate in the brain, and this lead, this is a pathological sign that your brain has been injured. So we are looking at that also in a mouse. So overall, I just want to thank uh, all the collaborators because we're working with a large number of groups across the US. Uh, thanks to the, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the DOD, and also the Roscombe Foundation to found the project. And uh, I have to say that we need to thank the troops as well as the family and the veterans for their service. So why right now, in terms of treatment for traumatic brain injury, I would say rest is very important. And then the next key thing is your family support. Family support could be your wife, your husband, and as well animals. As I saw, there is an animal here. For PTSD, for TBI, you need, this is very key to have a strong support from your employer as well and your family. If your wife or your husband leaves you because you get angry, you have mood disorder, then it always go worse and worse. You start to drink, you might get drug addiction, you lose your job, and you end up in the street. So if you have a strong wife who supports you, she will help you to keep up. And then we are here to help you as well. So you can see the neurologist. Excellent. So thank you again for coming. And uh, I'm going to hand... Uh, uh, the podium to the next speaker who will close <laughs> the session. And I will show you the video in the lab later. I don't know if there's a slide. Well, just a couple of... Um, uh, comments to summarize and uh, a few announcements. Um, I am uh, Cheryl Brandy. Um, I'm actually a doctor of nursing science, so I'm a different kind of doctor. Um, and I function here in the um, neurology clinic. Um, we're a full service neurology clinic. Um, and we do follow our clients out over the uh, trajectory of their uh, illness or their condition, and we're very committed to that. Um, I work very uh, closely with Dr. Keegan in that regard. Um, it is truly um, um, inspiring for me to be part of this um, team of people to be able to um, uh, work with people that are so um, dedicated to reducing the impact, uh, the socioeconomic as well as the um, um, personal impact of much of these devastating uh, neurological and neuropsychological conditions. And I think on the day, on my worst day when I'm coming to work and I'm thinking, um, what am I doing this for? Um, all I need is that first patient encounter with the patient and their family, um, and that puts the whole essence of what this is all about into perspective for me. Um, I also have the distinct um, um, honor, and um, I take great pride in this, uh, in that I am also a veteran. Um, I'm a retired Navy Nurse Corps commander, um, I spent over 23 years of continuous active duty service, and so I share a bond with many of you, and I hope to share uh, some stories with you um, a little bit later. Um, looking out over this audience, um, I can see that there probably was a time that you did not um, admit to your military service with pride, and it's a kind of a shameful period in our history. And thank goodness that the tides have turned on that because I truly am proud to have done uh, what I did. 
Um, and where those years went, I have no idea. It's like 23 years that are a blur in my memory, but what a fantastic experience that actually helped launch me into um, doing things that I'm doing today. Are there any Marine Corps uh, people here? Okay. Um, well, happy birthday, Marine Corps, um, because um, for anyone uh, who may not know, it's the 240th anniversary uh, of the Marine Corps, and November is the big month uh, for that. So um, I thank you all for your service also. Um, just a couple of announcements at this point. Um, oh, I, first I want to also thank Brookdale, uh, who is sponsoring your lunch today. Um, the Brookdale organization, uh, especially with uh, Megan uh, Burhalter, uh, who is available for any questions that you might have, have been wonderful in partnering with us to help us find solutions um, to very, some very complicated um, patient and client situations. Um, and they have always been ready on a very short notice to stand by to help us. So we're, we're really appreciative uh, to uh, Brookdale for your, um, for your uh, meal today. I know many of you are interested in a tour, and the plan is to gather towards the back. Um, there probably will be two sets of tours uh, because um, it's not feasible to take everyone through the labs and the clinic at one time. So uh, some of you, as I understand, will um, have lunch first and then um, uh, go on the tour, and there, so there'll be two sets of tours. Um, and the last thing I need to mention is um, please do not take any food or drink with you on the, the tour so um, you can protect um, the labs. So I hope you enjoy um, the rest of this, this day. Um, I hope I have the chance and all of us have the chance to sort of talk um, and share some stories, answer questions, and that you really have an appreciation and a deeper appreciation uh, for a place that really is truly, um, truly fascinating, I think. And, quite inspirational. So thank you for coming today. I have, I'm Bob Ross Kemp, and Diane and I are so privileged to be part of this a wonderful team. We started 20-some years ago at USF and moved the institute here in 2003 when we really outgrew it there and uh, never realized that it would grow to what it is today. Today you're going to, if you do the tour of the, of the labs, you'll see 50,000 square feet of, of laboratories and instruments and stuff, and you won't understand most of them, but there's probably $50 million worth of equipment back there today. Tools that we didn't have 10 years ago and today we can do things overnight that you couldn't even do. And if you could do it, it would take you a Petri dish and many years to do. So Roskamp Institute has grown to 65 staff or so, a lot of mouths to feed, but we're, and a lot of mice to feed. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to say one, one little statistic of your good question about mice and people. Mice have 97% of the same genes I do, okay? Now their brain is different because they're obviously very small, but they use, I think they're a very, very valuable resource to us in terms of trials. But um, we've, we are a debt-free, um, thriving organization, but it's time to grow. There's a whole, we've made a car that can do a lot more than, than what we're doing. And we believe that the Ross Camp Institute at this stage has time, it should grow. We don't have the particular resources to make it grow that much. So we're looking out to the community. We're, we're becoming more visible in the community until a few years ago, most people thought it was probably a little hole in the wall, uh, and you'll find today that it's not. It's, it's a magnificent uh, organization uh, studying the most difficult problem we've got, which is the brain. And there's so much that can be done 
and should be done for all the different diseases that is in every family, not just post-traumatic stress and not just Gulf War illness, but depression, bipolar, and all those things are just as complicated. And we have the tools to do it. We just need a more building, more money, and we'll get that somehow because we're dedicated to do that. So I just want to thank the servicemen who are, and women who are here and uh, the staff who are so dedicated. And I hope you, they say it's a day wasted unless you've done four things. It's a day wasted unless you've laughed. We haven't laughed much yet, but let's try some more of that. It's a day wasted unless you've learned something new. And I think today you learned something new. It's a day wasted about, it's a day wasted unless you've found something or someone new to love, and maybe today this is the day. And it's a day wasted unless you've made the world a better place. Onward. Thank you.